if we're way apart, then there's no reason for me to spend any more time on the deal. If we might be in a strikeable range or a place where we can make a deal, then yeah, there's more time to spend. But that efficiency allows me to process a whole lot of deals really quickly and not spend my time on stuff that doesn't actually make sense. This is the Real Estate Investing Experience. We get it. Real estate can be rough sometimes. And that's why we bring in the experts to talk about the experiences you won't hear anywhere else with your hosts, John Cohen and Chris Grinzik. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Real Estate Investing Experience. I'm your host, Chris Grinzik, and with me as always is John Cohen. How are we doing, bud? Uh, we're good. We're, uh, we're arguing with some people right now. It's people trying to take advantage of other people, but that's, uh, that, that like is, me. that is the life of, uh, that's our life, right? It's never, uh, it's never easy. That's for sure. It's always good after a holiday weekend, jump back into things, get in the dirt. Um, but I think, I think we'll get over it. No, nah, we will. <laughs> it's nothing major. They're either going to do it or not, right? It's, it's uh, you know, I always tell people when someone tries to give me a time frame and pressure me into making a decision, you're never going to like the answer I give you because it's always going to be a well, tough shit, right? Mm -hmm. And he just got that email basically saying it is what it is, deal with it, or, you know, on to the next one. So, yep. And look, sometimes that's the way you got to do. You got no one to, no one to fold and no one to bluff, no one to stick exactly. your cards. Um, Awesome. But that being said, let's jump into today's episode. We got a really great guest on today. Excited to hear his story, um, learn from him, hear his experiences and all that stuff. So that being said, Jerome, thank you for coming on, bud. Great to be here, Chris. Glad to be with you guys. I'm a big fan of the show. Thank you. Thank you. So we're happy to have you on. Uh, can you tell everybody listening a little bit about you, who you are, your journey, and you know what you do today? Yeah, man. So I'm a corporate America dropout, right? I built a $20 million division for a Fortune 550. The reward for that was laying half the workforce off. I did that one year, said I'll never want to do that again. The next Thanksgiving, they told me I had to do the same thing. I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I uh, went back to the stoop my sophomore year in college. I was like, we were doing the math, me and a buddy of mine. It was like, I'm paying three ninety five. I've got two two roommates paying three ninety five. He had the same thing going on downstairs. The guy that owned the complex was making seven hundred thousand dollars a year. And like, we've never seen him, we never talked to him. We want to do that, right? Decouple your time for money. And so I thought I was gonna go buy an apartment building. Uh got told I didn't have the right experience and so I wasn't able to get a loan. So I started fixing and flipping houses. Then I met a guy uh, on a stoop again. The stoop's important for me. That's a porch for all you other people who don't live in <laughs> uh, And uh, he came in. He's like, let me check out the finishes on the house. And we were talking. He's like, do you know anything about this building? I was like, yeah, I tried to buy that five months ago. And they told me I didn't have the right experience. And he said, well, I'm getting ready to make an offer on it. Went through a bunch of changes, ended up in the deal with him doing joint venture and served as asset manager for that project. And once I signed that loan, every bank was willing to talk to me then because I had some press. We closed the deal. And so I took those talents, came back to North Carolina where I went to college and been buying here ever since. I love that. I think that's an awesome story. A little bit of a comeback, a little bit of stick it to them. So love to hear those stories. Um, for a little bit of further context, just so I understand, you talked about um, being a corporate dropout and then you talked about having a conversation in the sophomore year of college. Yeah. Was that, did you just kind of flip the timeline a little bit so that the sophomore conversation happened first and then the corporate stuff happened or did I have it confused? Yeah. So to put things in full context, right? Like I'm yeah. son of a soldier and a stay at home mom. Like there was like no wealth conversation in my house. There's no entrepreneurship. There was none of that. Go to school, get a good job, get married, have kids, work for 40 years, do the thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, realized in college, like that wasn't the path I wanted to go down, but I didn't have another way to go do it. So I just kept following the path. Right. And so when it came to the point, I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to have people come in and say, you have to do this or you have to do that. After running a PL and building this huge business by my, basically with no leadership or guidance, um, I, I went back to that. I was like, okay, now it's time for me to figure it out. I got some money in the bank. I got a credit score. I got some credentials. Like, somebody should be willing to lend to me. And I found out the hard way that that's not really how it works, right? With the banks, they want you to have bought a property of similar size, 
with a similar business plan before they put money in a deal. And it's not just the banks, it's uh, investors as well, right? So they want that track record. They want that proven experience doing what you say you want to do. And not everything's transferable for them. And so um, I had to figure out how to get in that space. And that took me a long time. Um, but, you know, the whole corporate thing was just a run to come back to where I started. It's funny when you talk about like getting your first loan, it just reminds me of like, you come out of college, you look for that entry level position and it says you need five years worth of experience. It's the same thing. It's like, how can I get the experience when you won't let me get the loan to buy the first property? And that's why um, I hear so many people go down that joint venture route. And I think it provides a tremendous amount of value and allow you getting your foot in the door. And that's how I got started with John, myself, my mom, my cousin. Um, same type of things, a little bit different. We were looking more for the experience side than necessarily the loan side, but yeah, it's awesome. I mean, it's just a way to utilize other people to allow yourself to get foot in the door and take some work off other people. So just so I understand, did you, you quit the job cause you hated it and then you just went right into fix and flip once you figured you couldn't buy the apartment complex. Is that right? Yeah. So I, I was spending time. I was knocking on doors, right? I got a deal. I got a deal. I want to do this deal. And they're like, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> And so, but I didn't have anybody in my network that done it, right? And I think that's a challenge for a lot of people is they don't know anybody that's done it. Today, you know, I, I know a whole lot more. Like I know about, oh, go to a conference. You can meet people at conferences, uh, listen to podcasts and join meetup groups or uh, join private Facebook groups. Like there's a whole lot of places where you can meet people today. But back when I was trying to get into the space, I didn't really understand any of that. Like the only conferences that I went to were uh, for the power industry, which is where I was working. And my company paid for that. To think that I would spend money to go to a conference for my own business was kind of foreign to me. But, you know, as you grow up, I guess you learn. And so I've learned a ton of, on the journey. That's funny. We, I was just on a panel um, where it's, it's, uh, it's part of Michael Blanc's Dealmaker Live, which is next weekend or two weekends from now. And uh, I was on a panel with five other guys. and we were talking about exactly that. And it's basically, you know, what's one thing you can do to scale your business. And every one of us gave our recommendations. And when I started my business, when I started on the multifamily side, not the original investment side, I was stubborn as shit. I still am, but I no partners, no nothing. I'm doing this by myself, partially because I don't want to lose people's money. Second of all, I just said, you know, I don't need help. Why, who, who needs help in this business? Right. Um, and it was fun. It worked. But, you know, I even, you know, when I first met Chris and his cousin, I said, guys, do this. I, I know it's going to make some money. And, and maybe they were like, eh, may, maybe not. But the one piece of advice that I gave that I tell people all the time, do whatever, you know, when you first start as many deals as you possibly, maybe it's raising money, maybe it's asset management, maybe it's renovation, just get involved in any amount of projects, because what you're going to do Maybe the project works, maybe the partnership lasts, maybe it falls apart, maybe you never do another deal. But when you go to meetups, when you meet people, even if it's just, hey, I'll check it on your property once a, once a month for you if it's an out-of-state person, what you're now doing is you're building a resume or a credibility sheet that now a bank will take you more serious or now an investor will take you more serious. And it's not, you know, yeah, if you're just driving a property for somebody, it may not appear as experience. But it's how you phrase that, not what you did, right? It's how, you know, I was, you know, I, it's what you put down and saying, oh, I've been driving properties. I've been touring properties. I've been working on properties. I've been the eyes and ears, boots on the ground for 12 months. So you're a hundred percent right where out of the box, it may seem like shit. I can't do this. How do I figure it out? And you slowly learn. But I tell people all the time, just, you know, get involved. The first three projects I did, you know, one was my own, one was an investment and one I helped raise some money for. And, you know, within six months, I had a hundred units, you know, 150 units and the doors just blow open. Right now, all the banks are like, oh, wow, look, you know what you're doing? You're, you know, I had no idea what I was doing. Nobody knew what they were doing, but, <laughs> but that is what they need to say, oh, check off the box experience this is, a, you know, a super sophisticated investor, you know, hundred doors in six months. You know, what does that mean? Right now we, you know, we have 2,500 apartments now and, and we know probably less today than we did when we started because it's just different. So 
Um, I give you a ton of credit for figuring it out because most people quit right there and they're like, ah, I can't do this. I'll just go back or I'll do something different. You were persistent and, and, and you made it happen. And, and it's that guy that came over to you and said, what do you know about it? Next thing you know, bang, there's your deal. And it's just, you know, it's not right place, right time. It's, it's the hard work that was put into to be the expert when some guy asks you a question. And that's where, you know, the value comes from. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's crazy because like, I got my professional engineering license, right? And I know less today about engineering than I did the day before I took the test, right? And it's like with the banks, the day after you close that first loan is, you know, a whole lot less because you're actually in the property and you know what you don't know or you're finding out what you didn't know that you thought you knew when you made all the assumptions when you made the model. Yeah. It's crazy when you figure out how much you really don't know and when you see new people come into the space, how overconfident they are about how, how they're going to do this. And, you know, I thought the, the Kent Clovier episode that you guys did was phenomenal because he was talking about like getting punched in the face and how people just assume like this thing is easy and how much they disrespect the craft. Right. Like if everybody that starts this journey definitely doesn't get to a deal. And a lot of people who start the deal end up losing money because they forget that they actually have to execute a business plan. All the hoopla around sourcing money and sourcing deals is not even the beginning of the battle. Like, I say, that might be the fun part. And you think you've overcome this major obstacle and you have, but your journey's about to begin because it's, you know, it's amazing. You know, you could put any model together and this is why brokers probably hate me today. And they love me prior to, because when they, want to throw something in my face or, or they put these projections together. What I do now, and for all the brokers listening, you probably got it from me. I take their pro formers from four or five years ago and three years ago, and I send them to them when they, when they relist the deal and the deal's actually performing worse than their projections. And then they have new projections in their new offering or their new book. I'm like, why should I believe that your projections are right? And it's not the broker, it's their teams and the underwriters at the company. I'm like, you guys miss so poorly on the last one. And now you want me to bite off into, you know, you can raise rents, you can lower expenses, you can do this. We have, you know, we've had 4,000 units. This is not a possibility. Your insurance isn't going to be this. You don't have taxes going up, right? And these are little things that maybe a new investor that, you know, gets that excitement doesn't realize until they get into a deal and they get punched or they get kicked or they get knocked down. And then you got to get up and figure it out. And that just makes you battle tested. and now your experience is there, right? Now you're, now you're really an investor. You're not just doing this for a hobby or a sport or, or for fun, which is nothing wrong with that. But if you want to make it a full-time business, the hobby component of it probably has to go away at some point. I am going to say something in defense of brokers though. They're not the ones that actually operate the property and decide on the final business plan. So I get your point a hundred percent, but at the end of the day, it's like, you know, we always say, right. How many times do we say, you know, your business plan goes out the window as soon as you buy the property because something's going to go wrong. So yes, I hear you. And 85% of the time, I think their projections are way too aggressive, but I do think you have to allow for some scenarios where the person who bought it just had no clue what they were doing. I mean, we, we just saw the one property in Indy where the NOI was lower than it was four years ago. And they're looking for double the price per door. You know, clearly they didn't operate a good business plan. Is that the broker's fault? I mean, there's obviously opportunity there. So I don't know. So yes, occasionally that is an <laughs> accurate statement. But when you're buying it from, you know, a professional person that's owned a couple thousand units and they've also messed it up, especially when the market's been so frothy, you got to realize at some point it's a game of hot potato. And that's, you're right. You're hundred percent right. I'm not hey, going to I'm just keeping it honest over here. That's <laughs> Somebody's got to put somewhat of a leash on you. That's true, because I, I am torching the ground that I walk on now and not caring. There, I'm just not seeing the value in people right now, right? There's just not, no one's bringing something to the table. So it's, you know, hey, if you're not going to bring anything to the table, you know, get on my list because, you know, we'll, we'll find it ourselves if, if you don't want to produce it. But For sure. it's, uh, it's intriguing to see how it's going to play out. I did think, I wanted to go back quick because I thought you said something interesting, John, about like even just driving properties for people. and. I know what's going to happen is a lot of people are going to discount that, but there's something to be said. Like we've driven properties our whole lives and we're driven by properties our whole lives. 
until I started working in apartments, I didn't even know there were apartment buildings on Long Island. I didn't know they existed. They were just buildings in my periphery. But now, whenever I notice it, I look at it from the lens of a real estate owner and investor, and I look at it completely differently. It's the same thing now where I drive through towns, you know, I just moved out east on Long Island. I'm driving through towns I haven't been in in 10 years. And I'm looking at it through the eyes of an investor, like, okay, this is like, you know, a B area, C area, A area. And you just look at it totally differently. So once you start going out and looking at properties with the idea of, hey, I'm going to buy, I'm going to invest in this property and this area, you start carrying a different lens with you that you're going to bring forward into so many other things. So I, I feel like a lot of people would have just glossed over what you said. And I think it's way more impactful and important than a lot of people are going to give credit to, especially once you then take that observation and you bring it back to whoever you're working with who has more experience and you start having conversations around that property and they can explain to you, hey, why this is good, why this is bad. You know, retail is around the corner, you know, shitty retail is around the corner. Um, You know, there's so many things that go into it. I just didn't want people to gloss over and not be like, ah, I'm not not going to do that. That's grunt work. There's a lot of value you can actually get from it. One of the best tips I ever got when I first started this real estate journey, right? I was working full time. And once I quit my job, maybe like 2013, 12, I, I actually, maybe a little bit of, yeah, about 2012, let's call it. I sat down with a real estate investor and he was a real estate agent and he was doing a lot of fix and flips. And I sat down with him and, and th- this is probably the best piece of advice I ever got that I could not. If anyone listening hears it, I mean, you want to flip houses, you want to be a real estate investor. He told me the best time to drive properties is when you're coming out of winter and you're going into spring, you know, in, in, that, in that period and then shortly into the summer for two reasons. He's also said, get in your car Saturday morning at six o'clock in the morning and drive because if there's no cars in the driveway, it might be vacant. Additionally, in that period of time, if you see the grass is really long, if you see that you're coming out of winter and there's a tarp on the roof, you can see things that as a regular person you're driving by, you probably don't notice. But when I drive around now, I joke around and I'm like, oh, look at this, you know, this, this person's probably dead, right? Or, you know, I, it, because you could just, you notice things that you've never noticed before. And that alone could be the best thing you've ever done as a real estate investor or starting, just getting in your car or walking out your front door and walking five, six, seven neighborhoods in the morning because you'll see if there's cars there. You'll see the activity that's going on Saturday morning at six o'clock. Who's not home, right? So you'll, you'll notice things and you'll see, oh, wow, look at this. Like the grass is really long. There's a lot of mail in the mailbox. But little things like that was the first piece for me to get involved in real estate where it's to be a real estate investor, you got to drive properties. You got to tour properties. You got to get inside of properties because you're, if you've never done it and you walk into a property, you may think it's a great deal, whether it's a fix and flip a multifamily, a retail deal, whatever it is, you may walk in and say, wow, this is beautiful, but you've toured one deal. So you have nothing to compare it to. So if you do that, I mean, that in itself, right? Write down the address, go online, look it up, see what's going on. I mean, that alone will give you more experience than anything else. I mean, and that's how I started after hearing that guy. I was like, holy shit. It was like eye opening to me. Cause then once you hear, it's like when you buy a new car, right? You buy a new car, when you pull out of the dealership, what is the only car you see on the road? Your car. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah. When, you, when you hear what to look for and you start looking, you see it. But if you didn't know that, you just drive past things and you don't even notice it. So um, I can't thank that guy enough. Additionally, um, I think anyone listening, if you, if you haven't started or you're struggling to start, you know, find some property. Yeah, I think from my perspective, it's like time in the space. I know people, there's a whole lot of people who try to do this business from the computer, right? Mm-hmm. They don't want to do everything. They don't want to send emails. They, they don't want to spend any time on property. They don't want to spend time sitting with property managers. They don't want to do any of that stuff with the ambition of actually owning a property. And there's so much stuff you can pick up on being in the space, whether it's just looking down the street and seeing, hey, there's a junkyard next door. Like I was talking to a guy who was looking at a deal is across the street from a cemetery. He'd never been there. He was ready to buy. And it's like, uh, I mean, certain demographics aren't going to live across the street from a cemetery. Some people think cool. others are not going to live there. So you want to make sure you understand the population base in that area because you might be empty if you're not careful. Without a doubt. 
it's so important. I've been on a mini kick lately of people investing out of state and it being overhyped because I think it is because I think it's an excuse to do stuff from your computer and not actually do work. And the person that lives, anybody that doesn't live in an ultra high cost of living area really should be trying to do it in their backyard first before they go out and do it. And so when I hear people from Texas, Florida, Tennessee, Georgia, the Carolinas, yeah, if you live in a place like Charlotte and you want to buy 300 unit properties, that might be getting tough because you're going to be buying sub five caps and that may not be what you want, but that's okay. There's, you know, five other markets within a five hour drive of Charlotte that you can go do. It's a lot tougher when you live in places like LA, Miami, New York, Chicago, to a certain degree, there's just not as many options. And I think right now everybody's on this kick of technology, investing out of state, and it's great, right? You totally can if you want to live where you live, invest where you want. I get that 100%. However, I think now it's almost straying a little bit too far if too many people are using it as a convenient excuse to not do the physical work that's needed when you're really buying real estate because there's something to be said for knowing the area you're investing in, like the back of your hand. And I think too many people discount that. Without question. So for me, like people, I buy in my backyard and I only buy in my backyard, right? If it's not within an hour of my home, I I probably won't even consider the deal. And I like to be able to have somebody send me the address and be able to say, all right, rent should be X for that type of property. And I can tell the person within a couple of minutes what I'm willing to pay for, assuming that the property is in great condition, right? And if we're way apart, then there's no reason for me to spend any more time on the deal. If we might be in a strikeable range or a place where we can make a deal, then yeah, there's more time to spend. But that efficiency allows me to process a whole lot of deals really quickly and not spend my time on stuff that doesn't actually make sense. People don't you know, hear what he said, right? When you're an expert at something and you could make that fine line, you know, within an hour, whatever it is, because you know instantaneously when a deal comes in, how much time to spend on it. Half the battle in this business is time management, if not more than half the time. It's time, ma- you know, how do you spend time raising money? How do you spend time investor relations? How do you spend time finding deals? And if you have to spend time on a deal that equates to zero or worthless or nowhere near expectations, let's say it takes you an hour and you spent 45 minutes doing research on the area where maybe it passes the test. Next thing you know, you get to the price and the rent or whatever it is. And you're like, shit, you know, I'm 40% off of what they want. You know, you could have spent 30 minutes looking at more deals. You could have spent 30 minutes calling people. You could have spent 30 minutes driving around. So, you know, people take that loosely. And, and like Chris says, and I know it's been a little push of ours, there's been this like trend to just invest out of state because it's so easy and it's great. But what do I say all the I say it all the time. The, bi- the, m- the biggest challenge for me coming from doing multifamily sales in Brooklyn and Queens was I knew every single street, every single owner, every single address. You, you drop me, if you pick me up and drop me, I can say Mr. Jones, Mr. Porter, well, you know, I can go down the block and name the owners because there was 4,000 properties that I had to memorize, right? In, in, 15 block radius. But when you pick me up and you drop me in Columbus, Ohio at first, you know, the deal looks pretty. Then you get there, you're in a war zone, right? So you got to understand that the biggest challenge for me was when I got outside of knowing everything and having to learn it quickly. Because when you are an expert in an area and a broker sends you a deal or someone sends you a deal, when you Google the address, you could say, no, you know, worth this, worth that. So I, I don't think that, you know, I think it's easy to just say, oh, I'll do it out of, you know, not in my backyard because it's hard or, or whatever. But when you're an expert, you probably can get through 20 deals before someone can get through two if they don't know what they're talking about. It just makes you, you know, that much better at what you do. And I, I think being an expert is undervalued right now. I think people are just completely disrespecting the craft. Like expertise matters and it's going to matter even more with the market that we're in today, right? If you don't know what you're doing, you're going to lose other people's money, which I appreciate you talking about early on, John. Like, if don't take other people's money if you're going to lose it, right? Preservation of capital is the most important thing you can do. And I hate when people come into the space and it's like, oh, well, it's other people's money. It doesn't matter if I lose it. No, that's not okay. <laughs> like, I, 
I think some people think like this is technology and they're building an app and it doesn't matter. It, it absolutely matters. And you make it harder for people who are actually working to be experts and focused on delivering results to the people that they partner with, because now investors are confused about who they should partner with and who should they invest with and who can they trust. And like, I think there's a level of integrity and honor that has to be upheld by the people who are taking money. Because if we don't do that, then the deals die because nobody knows who they can trust and who they can't trust. And, um, you know, the, the person who can win the most people over, you know, that no like and trust triangle is the person who's going to have the most success because they actually have the cash and capital to do the deal. Yep. And we see it all the time on closing statements when we sell deals. Um, yeah, I mean, on closing statement, do you see what other investors are, you know, acquisition fees and, and you see some of these percentages and you see some things that go on and you just scratch your head like, shit, man, like, you know, this deal was, you know, they got a decent buy. They just whacked the investors over the head for acquisition fees. And those are things that they're just deal costs. It just makes the deal more expensive. And in real estate, you know, it's, it's you make your money when you buy. So if you're just adding costs to it, it means you have to be that much better at your acquisition. And you're hundred percent right. You know, there, you know, I think people discount the value of an investor sometimes when it's like, Oh, it's not my money. Well, yeah, but that's going to hurt you 10 times over. And additionally, all you're doing is, you know, we're just moving the pieces around, but we're, you're creating a disaster because you're, you're, you're creating problems around, you know, the good people out there or whatever. So I think you're hundred percent right. You know, anyone that says, Oh, well, it's not my money. That's not really the way you look at it. I know all the deals we buy for the most part, you know, we have a good chunk of money in it, either myself, Chris, our partner, our, my partner, Don, or, you know, our family members. So, you know, we're putting our money where our mouth is. So we believe in the deal before we even say, oh, can we raise $5 million or $8 million? It's, well, you know, we would put $2 million into this. So yeah, can we raise three? Not a problem, right? So I, I don't think people do that enough. I think it's been su- such a trend or a fad or, or a thing right now where it's like, oh, just go take some money, give a guy 12% and, you know, refi him out in 12 months. Like it's the easiest thing in the world to do. So I, I don't think people you know, talk about that much. It's not that easy to do. <laughs> Into the refinance of it after you executed the business plan is a big deal. Mm-hmm. And uh, most people don't actually get that done. There's yep. a whole lot that say they do. And it's funny you say, yeah, just give them 12%. Well, you actually got to make the money to give them 12% mm-hmm. unless you overraise, which I see people doing too, right? Where they're overfunding the raise in the beginning and then giving people their money back and saying that they're turning a profit or they're giving them a return on their investment. Which, you know, that's a whole lot of smoke and mirrors, man, for sure. You know, and to dive deeper on this point, I don't want to be the dead horse, but I think it's relevant. So we're working on a development deal here in Greensboro. And we had one of the tax credit guys come in. He's like, yeah, you can do it. And he's like, yeah, it'll cost about one hundred and seventy-five to 185000 per unit. I was like, what? Because we can build stuff here for under 100000 a unit. And so my question was, so if I build the project this way, how can I ever sell it? Right. Because you're talking about all the fees. Right. So we're loading in our developer fee. We're loading in all this other stuff. We're inflating the cost of construction so we get a bigger fee. And so after I do that, when do I actually sell it and how do I actually cash flow? Mm-hmm. And he's like, why, why are you asking those questions? Like you're going to get a few million up front. And I'm like, well, I still got to operate the deal. <laughs> Like, I mean, it's a, it's a longer play. And so, you know, there, there's a whole lot of perspectives out there on how to get things done. And, you know, there's one to take care of the investors and the uh, partners in the deal. There's another to just figure out how you can line your own pockets. And I, I don't think you have a very long career if you're only worried about filling your pockets. Well, it's funny you say that because you talk, talk about like, you know, how long your career is going to be and, and, we were on a, you know, a, a panel, I, I referenced it again, and, and Neil Bawa was on it. And he thinks differently about everything, right? And he's right now working on what I think is just fucking awesome, a way to sell these syndication models or development models to venture capitalists to basically say, here's my business, give me a 3x multiple, it's yours where they can buy it and turn profits. And he said, uh, you know, the problem with a lot of these businesses is that they're long-term, fo- you know, they're not, you're only as good as what you've done. You're not creating anything that's sellable on the market. And Brian Burke was also on the panel 
And he said, well, I'm not like Neil. I'm going to be doing this till I'm 90 because, but, but it's the business plan and it's the long-term look at something where it's, you know, are you going to, what are you trying to accomplish? And I don't think people go into the deals, you know, with that plan. Like you said, you build a deal for a hundred, you know, how are you going to sell it? Right. What's the exit plan? How do I operate this thing? It's too expensive, but you go into it with, Hey, I'm building it really cheap. I have a sales exit. I have a cash flow exit. I have a refinance exit. You, you, you make yourself a significantly better business plan, whether it's a recap buyout investors, whether it's a sale a refi or whatever it is, you have options. When you go in with one strategy, if it doesn't work, you're left holding the bag. So, you know, Neil's onto something crazy, right? Can you build a little syndication bills business and sell it for a hundred million dollars to a venture capital firm? And Brian's also onto something where he says, well, no, I just want to own 5,000 units and cash flow for the rest of my life and just keep buying deals and selling deals. But it all comes back to, you know, buying right, doing the right thing and, and making sure you have options to leave as opposed to being stuck because your price is too high or you're just doing it for fee development. Right. I, so what Neil's talking about is, I could have swore Grant Cardone's talking about the same thing, right? It's build something so big that there's only three or four buyers in the country that can buy it and then sell it at a premium because you've got all these balance sheets aggregated or these cash flows aggregated and they, they're looking for something stable and steady. Yep, 100%. It, it's yeah. such, you know, it's not unsimilar to, you know, what we're you know, quasi doing, you know, it's definitely intention to go into a market, buy 1,000, 2,000, 2,500 units. Uh, in a three to five year period where you could then exit with 2,500 units because your buyer pool for that is a different, is a different buyer than a buyer for, you know, a hundred unit complex, right? And now you can sell them as one offs or you can sell them as a package. And if they've all gone through the same renovation and they all are relatively similar, you have a little brand that you can sell. Maybe it's not as sophisticated as Neil because I'm, you know, I'm a bull in a China closet, not, you know, a, you know, super detail engineered focused mind, but you're right. You know, if, if you're, you know, you're getting something to somebody that you're putting a product in front of a different person that can pay a premium because who their investors are or what they're looking to accomplish. So it's, it's a smart business plan, but then you got to execute it on. So it's, it's intriguing. Yeah. I think it's just having, it's just another level of the exit plan that you were talking about. You know, it's, do you sell them as one-offs? Do you sell a few as, you know, do you sell it as a couple batches? Do you sell it as one big portfolio? And again, it's just, it allows you to have several different options to generate the best return for you and your investors. It's just another layer of whatever business plan you put in place for every single deal. Now it's okay. Yeah. For the exit plan bucket sale. Now there's several other buckets underneath it that just allows us to continue to maximize and grow efficiencies for all those deals. Um, and it's interesting too, hearing you talk about selling the actual syndication model. And I think some people are going to be like, why would somebody pay a premium, right? If it's, if the market's a five cap, why would I pay a four and a half? If the market's a four, why would I pay a three and a half? And I think it's directly correlated to what we were talking about with Andrew Keel on the mobile home stuff. It's why are some people buying mobile home parks all cash for three caps? It's because they see it as a development play in 10 years. And instead of buying land that doesn't cash flow, they can buy land that makes them 3% a year, which to somebody that's looking to just buy a mobile home park, it makes no sense because you're going to buy it for 3% and you're going to borrow debt at four or five. It's negative cash flow. It doesn't make sense. But for the right buyer, it makes sense. So it's the same thing of if you can put something in play that makes sense for the right buyer and they have a bigger plan that fits into other stuff they're doing, there is the possibility or the potential for that premium to be added on top of it. So you have to understand that as you get larger and bigger and you talk about you know, the Fortune 500 world, it's just a totally different ballpark and you're not going to fully understand how people view things or how it's going to fit into their conglomerate or to their other business plans. So I just want people as they're thinking of like, you know, the market's the market, it's going to sell for what it is, the premium, there's other things that can affect what somebody is willing to pay, especially if you're selling to somebody like a venture capital firm or somebody's looking to enter into a market at scale day one. Um, you know, there's a lot of other things that come into play. For sure. I, I just watched somebody buy an apartment complex that's on a major thoroughfare. I was like, 
how in the world can you guys pay that? And as soon as the day after they closed, they put a sign that said uh, development site for sale or development site available. And so they paid two million for some apartments and they're going to turn around and develop it in a strip mall and turn it into a $20 million development deal. I'm like, I, I can't count that high. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead. What were you going to say? No, nah, go ahead. No, you first. All right. I was just going to ask, um, you know, I know you mentioned, uh, Greenville, and we talked a little bit about some of the stuff you're doing. Um, but I was going to ask, you know, what is more of the focus? What are you guys working on um, currently? Yeah, I mean, so we, we want to build a thousand door portfolio here in Greensboro, right? And it's solely focused on workforce housing. Uh, we don't say affordable, we say workforce because we're looking for, you know, police officers, firefighters, teachers. We want to house those folks who aren't ready to go into a single family home yet. And just want a good, affordable, safe place to live. And so we talk about the ag- aggregation of balance sheets or cash flow. You know, for us, we're buying smaller properties, all in joint venture models, with the thought that you know we can put this amazing package together. That you know, people who wouldn't traditionally want scattered site, if we can buy everything within a block or two of each other, or dominate you know a couple of different blocks and have two fifty here or three hundred there, um, we can make something really desirable that hadn't been desirable in the past. And so we really like townhome communities as a play for us. I think that's interesting. So what are you guys up to right now? So we, we've got the development deal going and we're going through the process with HUD right now. So that's a mixture of 20 townhomes and 90, what is it? A hundred apartment buildings. So it's 120 in total. Nice. Um, then we're operating the four complexes that we already have in market and looking at deals every week, trying to figure out which ones actually make sense to make a play. Because we're not looking to buy anything that's super distressed. We want to put okay. bank debt on everything that we do. And so, you know, we're not one of these people who feel like we're going to get a great discount post COVID, right? Those great discounts are going to come from people who are in real trouble and you don't know when it's going to hit bottom mm-hmm. and the banks aren't going to invest in that, right? So we like to put 75, 80% leverage on our deals. and we need somebody that's got strong financials so that we can present that uh, trailing 12 to the bank. So we're just looking to buy solid deals in solid neighborhoods and operate them based on whatever issues we see, whether it's vacancy or some operational issue. So talk, I want to talk a little bit about that because I think it's interesting. I think so many people and ourselves included look for the distressed opportunities and especially with what's going on now, you know, there's so much dry powder on the sidelines from big institutions and a lot of people, in the similar world as all three of us kind of waiting for opportunities at a discount or that could make sense. And you're kind of going a little bit of a different path. Why is it that you don't want to target, you know, heavily distressed or even mildly distressed opportunities now or going forward. And you really are looking for the more stable, less headache, we'll say um, very financeable options. I I'm risk averse just at the highest level. And with that said, like when you go to bridge that route, um, I've heard plenty of horror stories where people won't bring money to the table for you to finish your renovation and you got to dig in your pocket and fund it out of your own pocket. And if you're not liquid enough, you can get in trouble really quickly on those deals. Uh, you can, the other piece of that is I don't think this is the time to be in short term debt. Right. So if you get through, you renovate and you get to the end of the road and it's time for you to cash out because I've I don't have it on the desk anymore, but I had a a mortgage come due that was two million dollars. Right. And it's like, okay, I don't have two million dollars in the bank. If I can't refi, I'm stuck or I lose the asset. And once you do all that work, because you're not really making any money while you're going through the process of. Uh, renovating and executing a business plan. You get your payday when you refi or when you sell or when you're cash flowing on the back end of it. Mm-hmm. So I'm avoiding that piece of the risk. I'll, I'll let the people who, who can go buy the deals and cash go do those. And I'll pick up the other stuff because, you know, everybody's got their niche that they're playing in. And so I'm not competing with you guys for a deal because you're going after something that has a t- tremendous amount of upside, but the risk associated with it is a lot higher than what I can stomach. Like I want my deal to be able to, if I go down to 70% or 65% economic occupancy, 
I still want my deal to be able to cover the bills, right? And I've been all the way to zero, right? Our first deal, we, we went all the way to zero and we were in a construction loan from a bank. We were up to like 80% leverage or something like that. And writing a check every month to pay the mortgage is no fun. Like mm-hmm. absolutely no fun. And if you have any issues with the construction, you're digging in your pocket again. And, you know, I thought that I was really good at estimating costs, but every time I do a project, it costs more than I expected to cost, and it takes longer than I expected to take. It doesn't matter how <laughs> much top, right? If I go in and add 20%, it's, I still feel, figure out a way to spend it. And it's not just me. I know other people are experiencing the same thing. And it's just like, all right, well, now I'm going to go dive into the deep end of the pool. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm too, I think I'm probably too early in my transition or in my career to say, hey, like, I, I'm going to take that dive. I, on the, I just don't think the upside is there. And with the uncertainty on the back end, I don't want to be in bridge debt for 12 or 18 months. And then there's nobody who wants to take the loan out on the backside. Because all it takes is, especially with the agencies, all it takes is sometimes is five people moving out you don't have 90 for 90, if, even though you had 90 for 70, you got to start over. Mm. Right? And your bridge lender can do whatever they want with you. Mm-hmm. No, but, but I, think, I, I think being aware of that is important because I think everybody looks at, wow, heavy lift, major return. I don't think people put the pros and the cons on paper before they get into something. Because, you know, we've had the conversations internally, like these deals are fun. They're great, you know, but we said, okay, we'll steer away from them if we're in better locations in better markets. We're okay with you know, a lower return when the risk isn't associated with it. And most people, most people read a book, listen to some podcast and they think you're, you're right. It always is going to cost more and it's always going to be more time. I don't care. You can be the best in the world at estimating it and you're still going to be wrong. You know, it, it very infrequently does it go the opposite way. And if it is the opposite way, six months into the project, something's going to happen that's going to throw it off. It's just, that's just the laws of averages. Um, but, but being aware of the risk reward and understanding and saying, hey, listen, I'm not going after those deals. So our returns are going to reflect it, but I'm going to bed at night knowing that I'm not writing a mortgage. I don't think enough people talk about that and play on that as a strength. You know, everyone wants 30% returns, but nobody wants 30% return worth of risk and, and they go hand in hand. And, you know, you, you know I have this conversation all the time. People are like, well, you know, it, it's a, it's a 26. I'm like, yeah, I know, but the downside is it's, a, it, you know, the downside is much worse. I'd rather give me 6% with no headache. You know, it, it makes sense. And I don't, people don't talk about that. They always want more and more and more, but they don't want to give up the, you know, they don't want to give it the risk. They want a 30% return with no risk whatsoever. And just unfortunately it doesn't exist. Yeah, it's asymmetric. But I mean, just a point in case, right? I bought a 20 unit and I thought I had four vacancies. The day after I closed, I had eight, right? It's like, oh boy. <laughs> hey, we thought we were going to renovate four units and we ended up renovating 15. Like that, that wasn't in the business plan, right? And I mean, the bigger the property, the more opportunity you have for something like to happen. And depending on who you are, you can make a mess really, really quick. And so, you know, that's why we see guys like Dan Hanford in particular, like I admire what the guy's done. Like he's done two fifty million dollar deals in, in the past 12 months, but they're buying those super high quality assets that are A minuses and A or B markets and they're super predictable. There's not an aggressive value add component. It's just, hey, let's operate this thing and take out little efficiencies here and there. And, you know, a lot of people don't actually understand that or value that piece of the business. I I, I do want the bigger returns. I do want to double people's money over the course of five years, but, you know, I want to do it in a calculated risk manner, right? Because there's only so much of the risk you can manage out and there's only so much of the risk that you can plan for. Uh, These things are wild animals, especially if they've got some deferred maintenance or a property owner or manager who hasn't really been attentive to it. And you got to tame that bad boy, right? And it is 
run when you're on that bucking bronco. You you got to get it under control, and it can be a really wild ride. But you know, people don't talk about that piece because I, I was just about to say that I think that analogy is perfect. You know, these things as carbon copy as your model may spit out a return, you are dealing with a wild animal. I mean, you know, yes, a class A deal. You know, it it ain't as wild as a class C deal. We all understand that, but I love that analogy because. You know, we bought a deal that it's probably to date still the nicest property we own in a great location. Um, we had a property manager, an on-site manager that was running a whorehouse out of the leasing office. And additionally, they put in on a 240 unit property, they put in 69 unqualified tenants through our due diligence. So we literally bought the property that for 10 years the guy owned it for 10 years and he gave us all the financials. The occupancy never dropped below 88% in 10 years. So we underwrote this thing saying, wow, 88%, you know, that's our base case. We're good. Literally within three months, we were about 70% occupied because we ended up having to go through a war of evictions, you know, murders, dead bodies, uh, you know, some illegal prostitute. It was insane what we took over and we thought this was a b plus property you know situated you know in a perfect area but it, it just it didn't play out that way but we fixed the problems but you know luckily we were never in jeopardy of not paying the debt service the deal always supported itself because it was a it was what we believe to be a lighter lifting deal but uh you know even that deal you know it was it was a you know it was a horse of another color and that was you know it was it was a it was the largest property to date that we bought at the time yeah. And we just couldn't, we fixed something, something went wrong. We, we got, we evicted three people. We found another guy doing something wrong. So it was, it was, it was fun, but uh, it was painful. You know, it's been a long time, four years going and we're selling it now. So we're, we're happy as a pig and shit. <laughs> yeah. I, and to add insult to injury, like the nicest property I bought air quotes with nicest, like it's had the worst performance in COVID. Right. And everybody's talking about, oh, well, you know, the people who are, you know, less fortunate are the ones who aren't going to be able to pay. It seems like those many of those folks got a pay increase with all the extra money and support from the government. Uh, that's temporary. Right. But hopefully they're back to work by the time it all runs out. But, yeah, I mean, for the folks that are in the middle that didn't get a whole lot of support or, you know, their income drop from their job was a whole lot greater than what they were able to get in support from the government. Like. It shows up every day. I was just on a call with people who were talking about how they could assist property owners with, you know, tenants who were delinquent or residents who were delinquent because of COVID. And I, I started having a conversation with them like, hey, well, here's what's happening in my property. And they're like, yeah, well, you know, some of those folks don't qualify. So we'll see what we can do for the others. But, you know, this is an income based program. And it's just like, wow, it's really tough. So I think you got to be eyes wide open coming into this space. And, you know, some people will hear what John just said and be like, well, why in the world would I ever want to be in a business like that? It's like, there's not, not everybody's so honest, right? The guy who sold you the property pumped and dumped you, right? He, well, he so also, he also got arrested twice since, since so, so the, it was, it, but he appeared as the nicest guy in the world, local developer, good guy, but he just had a whole world of shit going on. And we, we ate all of it. <laughs> yeah, that, that sucks. But you know, there are some people going back to that initial conversation about integrity along the way, right? Like if you're going to be in this business long range and he's a perfect example, right? I, I don't know how long he was in the business, but he's not going to be in the business much more. No. If you're going to be in this business, you have to be upstanding. You got to have integrity. You got to have morals. It's the only way that you last. This is a long game. man. You just talked about executing on a four year business plan, right? <laughs> If you're if you're a jerk and you're trying to cut corners, you're not going to last very long. You're not going to get through many deals for sure. Hundred percent. No, I, I I think you're coming at it the right way. The approach, a whole nine yards. Understanding, you know, some people, especially because it's been a trend, right? You know, watch HGTV. I mean, there's literally a commercial on HGTV right now that says it's not rocket science; it's a renovation. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. But uh, I saw that the other night and I was like, this is why, you know, this is the problem out there. But you got to real estate's a long game, right? Fix and flips, not so much, right? You're going, you're flipping stuff. And I, I, I completely understand that. But when you set out on a real estate journey, 
you hear the story all the time. Oh, I flipped a house and made $200,000 and I went on financial freedom in 30 days, right? I'm not saying it doesn't happen. But what I'm saying is, you know, t- you know lace up your shoes, get ready because you are going to work and it's going to be a long game. Real estate is not day trading options. It's not get rich quick. It is a long game. So you have to go long. 100%. Crockpot. Um, beautiful. I just want to be cognizant of time. Um, I think that's a great place to wrap it up. Uh, Jerome, thank you so much for coming on, man. If people want to get in touch with you, connect with you, learn more about you, where can they do all that? Yeah, man. So MyersMethods.com breaks down our approach to real estate investing, specifically in multifamily. Um, you can jump on there, get a free four-step guide and learn why we like joint ventures over syndication. It's an unpopular view. But I think for anybody getting started, it's the right way to get into the game. And then if you want to connect on LinkedIn, um, Jerome Myers in Greensboro, North Carolina should be the only one there. Beautiful. Guys, definitely go check him out. Definitely go connect with him on LinkedIn. He does some great stuff. Um, Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you're not already subscribed, it would be awesome if you guys would. And if you are already subscribed, please send it to a friend, family member, colleague, acquaintance that you think would get a ton of value. It would mean the world to John and I. We also launched a Facebook group where we are trying to connect with everybody and anybody that listens to this podcast. We want to thank you for listening. Grow together, learn together. You can find that by going to facebook.com slash group slash the REI experience. Jerome, once again, bud, thank you so much for coming on. This was fantastic. Appreciate you guys.